Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to my channel. Amongst other things, I'm a reenactor and a jouster, but I also enjoy making stuff. Right here, I'm, um, I'm busy painting one of my shields. Um, I've got several shields. Um, I, uh, these are all jousting shields. You've seen some of my other ones in previous, um, in previous episodes on the channel. If you, uh, I mean, if this is your first time, then no doubt you haven't, but, uh, um, I have used them as props in several previous episodes on my channel. This one is, um, the one that I actually use for jousting. Um, I have used my silver tree one before for jousting. Uh, I haven't used my uh, my golden one. Both of those were actually not um, painted by me. They were both painted by uh, a friend of mine called George, uh, part of the Guild of St. Luke. Um, in fact, I think he is the Guild of St. Luke, or at least in England, he's the Guild of St. Luke. Uh, he is an incredible artist and those shields were painted uh, with real silver and real gold and um, with real um, authentic oil paints. This particular shield that I am uh, I'm doing here is not of the same kind. This is a plywood blank um, and I am painting, I, I don't think it's real gold leaf that I'm using it's very similar uh, similar to real gold leaf but it I don't think it it is actual gold it might be um not sure though because I got it from eBay so who quite knows um but this shield is um is gold leaf and acrylic paints because um yeah I'm not that used to working with oils and I really you know, if you want something completely authentic, go to go to George. But this is my attempt at a um, a fifteenth century tournament shield. Now, one of the things that um, a lot of people will like to say about shields, surviving shields, is very often they'll say things like, "Oh yes, this is a parade shield. This wouldn't have been used in an actual tournament." because it's far too elaborate. Um, and I think that kind of misses the point of tournaments. The whole point of a tournament is for you to show off. Um, tournaments were a display of your own personal prowess, but equally they were a display of your wealth and uh, um, just your disposable income, basically. There are plenty of examples of knights, uh, even kings throughout history, who bankrupted themselves throwing tournaments. Because tournaments are, are they're, they're the most uh, extravagant way that you can show your wealth and along with, you know, the other aspects of, um, of your knightly uh, abilities, you know, your your prowess at arms and your ability to wine and dine people and, and please the ladies and so on. So I think it's kind of um, this idea of the tournament shield being different to the parade shield is is very um, is very modern eyes looking at it. In fact, I think in a previous video, I've even said something that I, I stand by, which is that a tournament is basically a competitive parade. It is the um, the way that you show how rich you are. You wear your best armor. You wear awesome shields with gold leaf on them and jewels even. And that um, that is part of the spectacle. That's part of what you're doing. Now, obviously, not every tournament was like this. Some tournaments were... Um, were more, uh, we call them uh, a passage of arms. These might be in all sorts of different uh, ways. Whoever organised a, a past arms uh, would set their own rules and things like that. And some of them were very military. So you probably wouldn't expect um, 
to have quite so elaborate a thing. Uh, there's a great example of a pass d'armes in, um, in France where three knights basically just camped in a field for a month and they said, right, we're going to take on all comers. And people travelled from all around Europe to come and uh, face off against these three knights. There are other examples of pass d'armes which are completely the other end of the spectrum. A really good example is um, the Pass of the Golden Tree. Um, that was... Uh, organised by um, the Duke of Burgundy. So you know, if you know anything about um, European dukes and uh, and things like that, you know that he liked to uh, show off his wealth. We, th we think, I'm pretty sure that he basically gilded a tree um, in order to, uh, to have a tree in the... Uh, in the arena that he could hang his um, his shield on. So there was apparently a golden tree in the arena. It's very likely that it was uh, plated in pure gold. This kind of thing, it was just, oh man, these guys were rich and a tournament was a way that they could show their richness. It's also worth pointing out that no matter what happens, your shield is probably going to get trashed over the course of a tournament so you need a new one for each time these elaborate shields that people say oh they're just used for um for uh parades or, or they would have been trashed they're probably actually ones that were never used in a tournament but that doesn't mean that they weren't prepared for a tournament because you would likely have more than one shield with you so that you could replace one if it got trashed before the tournament was over. Now, as you can see here, uh, what I've done is I've undercoated my shield with um, several layers of black gesso, and then I've um, I've varnished it, and then I've painted it with some uh, gold leaf adhesive. I think there's a special name for it, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, and now I'm placing the uh, the gold leaf on top um, so that it covers all of the adhesive. And it looks quite messy here. Um, you know, it's just kind of sticking down. I'm pressing it down with a brush to try and make sure that it's all sticking properly. And now is the great bit. This is where you brush it. And gold leaf is so thin that... Even using just a little brush, you break off all the parts that aren't stuck down. And you can just see the shape of my design coming out. The shield, the tree, with its roots going down. And you can see the flakes of it. <laughs> if you decide to have a go at this yourself, um, please <laughs> have a plan for dealing with all of the spare gold leaf flakes. I'm still finding some around my house. Um, I noticed some in my son's hair the other day as he got into the bath. Um, there we go. It's so satisfying doing this. I think I will do it again. It's good fun. And you can see there, now the design is, um, is obvious. And now I need to clear up, get as much of the spare gold leaf off as possible using a hoover and you can see the gold design there just getting off a few bits that didn't come off with the brush there we go right here's the next day so I've now I've hit the shield with another coat of varnish and now I'm coming back in with some acrylic paint to put some definition on the design. Now, by the 15th century, um, a lot of tournament shields are not just displaying the arms of the, um, of the knight in question. Um, on the tournament field, it's not as key to know exactly who each individual is. So 
yes, they do often show the arms, not always, but what is important is that the people there know, can tell the difference between the different knights, not necessarily that they know immediately who each knight is. In fact, some tournaments actually um, require it. In fact, some, uh, some tournaments have the knights playing parts that aren't themselves. Um, now, as I said before, there was a famous pass d'armes called the Pass of the Golden Tree, which I particularly um, like. So what I have done with my shield is I've designed it to have a golden tree, uh, and then it has a painting of my shield hanging on the tree. So it's kind of like an inception uh, kind of thing. It's a shield within a shield, if you will. That's um, that's just, I'm now picking out, like I said, all of the edges of the shield and all of the design with some black paint. Originally, this would have been um, oil paint, which takes a much longer time to dry than acrylics. Um, and it is, you know, they would actually sometimes gild the whole shield and then paint over the top of it. Um, it might seem crazy, but it's true. Um, here I'm just adding in a little bit of shading as well to really make the um, the shield um, and the aspects of the uh, the design stand out from each other. It's so maybe not quite so visible, but again, one of the things that you notice when you look at these tournament shields is that they are striking from a distance, but the closer you get, you see actually there's loads of little details as well. And again, this is part of that tournament as a display of wealth, as a display of um, that particular individual's um, ability to perform his nightly duties, whether that be I'm so rich or, you know, I'm so skilled or whatever it is. I, uh, um, I rushed out a little bit there to grab some a different black paint one with, that has slightly better coverage because um, I was struggling to get um, get particularly good coverage over the top of the uh, gold leaf there. It was um, struggling. So here um, at the top of the shield, I have a, an M. This M is actually copied from a, um, a medieval manuscript. It's the initial of my wife. But you very often find um, references to various different things um, in tournament shields. Like I said, not just the arms of the person competing, but also references to family or friends or particular um, saints that they uh, venerate above others. Um, Now I'm coming in. The next thing for me to do is to do the actual design on my shield within a shield. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to map out the design just in paint. Now I was tempted to come in and do this with a pencil first, but I was worried that actually um, using a pencil might damage the gold leaf more than using paint and that actually the um, the surface of gold leaf is so um, slick and smooth that I would find it easier to mop off some paint if I got it wrong than I would to rub off some pencil um, which might then rub off the gold leaf as well. Uh, I will be jousting with this shield. I don't know if I've said that. I will be jousting with this shield. So I will do another video at some point telling you how much the um, the gold leaf has actually stuck around, how much it, uh, how well it has survived a uh, a tournament setting. Now you can see that my shield is actually very simple. Um, most shields of the period had 
lots of different layers, including some leather, some rawhide, some canvas, uh, various different things like that. They were often also um, shaped in more than one plane. So mine is very simple. It's a concave um, a concave shape, but it's otherwise flat. It's only concave in one plane. Um, a lot of period tournament shields, not all of them, but a lot of them are um, concave in one plane and convex in the other. So they kind of wrap around the shoulder a little bit, give you protection slightly from the side as well as uh, from the front. I think this is particularly important if you are jousting at large where you might not necessarily be um, just heading at someone from uh, from straight on where you might actually be coming at them from a slight angle. You want that shield to go around the side. But also, um, I found and my friends who joust in the balsa style of jousting have found that having a convex shape on a shield with balsa jousting can actually cause problems. Now, the reason for that is that with balsa jousting, we don't use steel coronals. The uh, spike on the end of the lance is generally made out of a hard rubber, which means that that doesn't bite into the shield in the same way that a steel coronal does. Uh, so when a steel coronal hits, it bites into the wood of the shield, um, whether it's going straight on, whether it's hitting at a 90 degree angle or not. However, a rubber coronal doesn't have the strength in it to bite into the shield like that. So if it doesn't hit at a 90 degree angle, then it is likely to glance off. So therefore, the shape of a balsa jousting shield needs to be simpler so that it doesn't create multi facets that will, uh, that will make the lance, the balsa lance, glance off at an uncontrolled angle. That's the main problem, right? You don't want your lance to be uncontrolled at any point. If you're using a steel coronal, in fact, some people have said that it it's, can be uh, a safety feature to use a steel coronal because you know that when it hits, it bites. So it sticks, it goes in one place, it goes where you put it. Whereas um, if you are using a convex shield or a shield that has some convex faces, uh, it is more likely that that uh, coronal can glance off of the um, of the shield and can um, go somewhere that the jouster didn't intend it to go. Here you can see I'm filling in the colour. This shield um, is pretty simple. I've, uh, as I often do, I've left my project reasonably late, so I don't have a huge amount of time to do lots of um, lots of stuff on this shield. Some tournament shields include whole um, depictions. There's a beautiful one in, uh, I think it's in the British Museum called Vu ou la Mort, which is um, it's absolutely amazing as a piece of art. It's down as a parade shield, but I genuinely believe that it was probably a tournament shield that ended up not getting used. Um, and it's a painting of a uh, of a man standing in front of his beloved, uh, declaring his love for her, and behind him, death is waiting at his shoulder. It's so cool, and um, I'd love to do a version of that one day. So if that's something that you'd like to see on the channel, please leave a comment down below, and uh, at some point I'll see if I can do something more elaborate than uh, uh, than just this simple one. But uh, um, yeah, here we go. I'm still filling in the red. This uh, um, this actually took quite a long time because um, because the red doesn't cover um, quite as nicely as the black did. Um, the black went over very well. The red needed a couple of coats uh, even after um, after I'd finished first putting uh, putting on the first coat as you see here. Not only that, but I went back afterwards. Um, I wasn't entirely happy with it. I didn't get footage of this, but I um, I also added some more detail to the red um, with some extra lines and some extra dots. 
And that's something, again, you see uh, very often. It, it might not be perfect, but they didn't uh, I say perfect. Asymmetry was never considered to be imperfection. Um, in these paintings, things were not supposed to be completely like a machine made them. You know, they're, we're used to perfection being something being completely symmetrical. That's not a thing. Anyway, here are some uh, shots of the finished shield. I really hope you like them. If you like this video, please do like, share and subscribe, all of those good things. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye.